I guess you all know that situation from when you were students. That, you know, you know there was an exam coming up and you were just learning the stuff that was going to be asked in the exam and not looking at the, the broader context, right? So just do the things that the examiner would measure. What gets measured gets done. And, and maybe, maybe at the same, same time in, in, in the economy, economy right? Everybody, everybody measures GDP, GDP, so that's, that's what politicians, politicians focus, focus about doing. doing. But maybe the GDP is not the best measure in the world to see whether they are performing well as a country or such a product. So that's a topic that uh, Victor Hoekstra will tell us about. And he's been busy with that, um, as I'm sure to Professor and I, for 15 years, you just said. Um, well, I lost my note. I have a very impressive list of all the green yeah, you have been talking to, like the UN. Telling them that the economy should work for the people, or the people for the economy. European Commission, uh, World, World Bank, Bank, and, and several more. more I forgot. I forgot. Um, so, um, so, so, but I guess there was so much engagement on your side. It's so pretty so much hope that the goal of replacing GDP by 2030 will be fulfilled, and we are happy to hear from you how we how we're going to do that. Floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Probably uh, an audience that I don't often uh, speak to um, uh, complex issues. I'm really looking forward to the uh, to the discussion. Maybe a little bit of background. Uh, I actually was very motivated by environmental problems uh, when I was very young, uh, perhaps uh, unfortunately young. Uh, so acid rain, um, the ozone layer, those were things that as a teenager I was already motivated by. And then my father told me, uh, you know, if you really want to understand these environmental problems and solve them, you should also learn about the economy. So I, I went to Wageningen uh, to study a new uh, topic uh, called environmental economics, uh, Echo from Irland. I don't know whether people uh, know him, but it was really, I really was motivated to study economics, not for the economics itself, but actually to, to try and see whether I could solve environmental uh, problems. And then I did a PhD in, in at the PU uh, with Jeroen von der Berg, uh, uh, more uh, less mainstream economics, but more ecological economics, it's called. Um, and then I started to work at the statistical office. And then I was confronted with, by the fact that GDP, when the statistical office published GDP, back then all the journalists would flock towards the press room to hear the latest uh, figure. And whenever we had any statistics on the environment or society or, or other aspects, we had loads of statistics, but there was no interest. And that really got me on this journey of not just trying to understand the scientific aspects of the alternatives to GDP, uh, which, of which I'll also show you a lot, but actually also the societal impact. Why? do we pay attention uh, to GDP rather than these other uh, metrics? Now, uh, Claudia said, uh, I, I have not actually been working at Leiden Institute uh, University for 50 years. I, I'm actually a head integrator in Dutch. Uh, after my PhD, I went to work in the statistical office uh, at EMG. I worked for the World Bank, UN. And now since the 1st of January, I'm, uh, I'm back in academia, but I'm of course then taking my insights from I guess the uh, the outside world in this project. Now I'm currently the coordinator of a project called Wide Horizons, and I'll tell you a little bit about that yeah. in, a, in a in a moment. So what I'd like to do today is just go through the economic growth paradigm. You know, what did it, where did it come from, and uh, you know, what are its flaws? Then the momentum that is currently behind a movement to actually go beyond uh, GDP. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the aims of Wise Horizons, and then we can have a discussion on how that relates to complex systems. I think it's a cardinal sin to call it complexity, right? In a group like this, or or not <laughs> complex systems. I, I think uh, so. We can have a discussion maybe on whether there are links also with uh, research that you're doing. So this is the model we're currently working on, just to try and understand why did the economic narrative after the Second World War become so uh, so powerful. And I'll give you a very short version of it. Basically, we're looking at it from three different perspectives. First, there's just the technical aspects, right? So how do you uh, how do you measure a GDP? 
what accounting system uh, do you use? Uh, the system of national accounts. And also the ability to model macroeconomic developments is also part of this technical discussion among scientists and um, sometimes also policy institutes. Then there's a second layer is that actually a lot of this technical stuff then gets used in policy institutes, international institutes, governments, uh, in the media, at universities. Uh, so there's an institutional uh, aspect to this debate. And one I've been finding very interesting uh, lately is the narrative level. What are the stories? You, you know, a number is just a number. But what are the stories being told with, with this number? And so we're trying to analyze also the success of, of the economic paradigm uh, using this framework. Um, and just to give you an indication, this is a graph from my book. Um, you know, we're kind of used to 200 countries measuring GDP, and many of them actually doing it every quarter. But this is just a historical moment in time. If you went back to 1900, there had only been nine countries that had ever in their history measured a national income figure. And so it's a fairly new, I would say, social innovation that we actually have a number. And we're really used to the fact that it's a harmonized number in 200 countries uh, of the world. And as you see, something basically happened around uh, the war. A, a newer graph, which I, I didn't have in my book, but new research that we're doing is also on the narrative level. So concurrently with this development, uh, we can analyze the archives of the New York Times uh, and just to get, uh, very simple metrics on the share of articles which have a certain word in them. And so we have the words economy, uh, economic, uh, economic growth. And as you can see, this is like the Great Depression. So the worst episode of financial and economic crisis that we had actually and in that previous century. And the word economy only appeared in 2% of the articles of the New York Times. And if you fast forward to, um, to 2020, the COVID pandemic, around the sixth actually of articles actually have the word economy in them. And as you can see, there's kind of a, a secular trend or a, an upward trend. And basically during each economic crisis, of course, we start talking about the economy more because it's, it's a real problem at that stage. And then we plateau at a higher level. So basically, I think this message is that the economy is important. We're constantly being bombarded with the word economy and economic. And you could also argue that as we become richer, perhaps we should talk about the economy less. But in fact, what we're doing is we're talking about the economy more. And this is sending a message that the economy is important. And what I find really interesting about the term economic growth is that that did not exist. Um, basically before 1955. And this is because the statistical office started publishing uh, quarterly GDP figures in 1948 in the US. And basically without a quantification, uh, this word is, is basically meaningless. But so the word economic growth was coined by economists and we have now in our lexicon that we all have some understanding of what that actually means. And we're also looking at New York Times from a different perspective, also trying to see whether we can see other narratives. And the second narrative that we're trying to uncover is, is the adjectives that are used when we're talking about the economy. If you have a GDP number, it's scientifically correct to say that it's increasing or decreasing. It's a measure of economic growth. So you can say whether economic growth is increasing or decreasing. But journalists, of course, when they're describing these numbers, actually add adjectives to this words. So they don't use the scientific term. They actually use adjectives such as strong, uh, booming, healthy, robust. And they use weak, sluggish, uh, slowing, uh, stagnant uh, for, for uh, when they're describing lower GDP figures. And so this is adding a normative element where the reader is actually being trying to basically to understand which direction is good while it's, uh, you know, it, it has the connotation that it's a wider figure and that this is a good thing. Um, so I think sometimes in the translation of the, you know, just the statistical reality, 
there is sometimes also a normative level that is added to the to the debate. But one mystery that, or one thing that I stressed in my book is that you know there are so many actors in all of this that are actually coordinating at a global level, statistical institutes, um, uh, media, uh, institutions, uh, government organizations. <laughs> so there must be some kind of uh, um, success or some kind of foundation for this. And in my book, I argue one of the primary foundations is the, a system of national accounts. So in 1953, what happened is that before 1953, all countries measured their economy differently. So in the Netherlands, we had Tim Berrigan, the first Nobel Prize winner. He actually had his own ideas about national accounting. And so did the Swedes, the UK, Canada, uh, the US. They all had their different perspectives on what a macroeconomy was. But in 1953, the UN said, no, we're going to strive towards one uh, system and basically 10 macroeconomists got into a room uh, under a leadership of Richard Stone. And you know, you could see this as kind of a handbook on how to measure GDP, but at the same time, it's also a dictionary. It gives us the terms with which we have scientific discussions, we have institutional discussions, and we have narratives in society. And without a language, just imagine if we didn't have an English dictionary and we basically all democratically decided to speak our own language today, uh, you know, that is really important to actually have conversations and to, to have as a form of a community to have a, a common language. And so what I, what I try and stress in the book is that this system of national accounts is not just a measurement system for GDP, it's also a, a dictionary and a grammar book about how uh, how to have discourses in economics. And so that is, is I th think, a very fundamental part of binding this, uh, this community and this economic um, uh, growth paradigm. Now, this is usually the most boring part, like what is wrong with GDP? Because for 50 years, people have been publishing articles about, uh, about this topic. So I want to keep this quite brief. Um, GDP is a measure of economic activity, and so it's not a direct measure of well-being. I, I think everybody in the room understands that your income is not directly related uh, to your well-being. There are many factors, of course, beyond your income um, that are important, although your income does, of course, have an influence on it. GDP is a measure actually of current economic activity, and so it doesn't have any forward-looking information. So it doesn't tell you anything about the future or sustainability. And of course, GDP is a, an aggregate measure for the whole of society, and so it doesn't tell you anything about distributions uh, within the society. Now, economists sometimes will um, stress three points, and, and that is basically, well, you know, although GDP, we know it's not really a direct measure of well-being, it's kind of correlated to well-being in many different ways. How would we pay for health uh, expenditure, educational expenditure? You know, we need to buy things, housing. There are lots of things in our lives that cost money. And especially also when you're looking at the global south, for example, there, of course, there's also a better argument to say that, you know, they need to uh, go towards higher income levels uh, before there's a tapering off in the relationship between uh, GDP and well-being. Second argument that's, that was prevalent in the 1990s and was called the environmental Kuznets curve, uh, and now is kind of called green growth, is basically uh, the idea that we need to grow um, uh, to grow to actually create sustainability. Uh, so in a way that uh, the environment is a luxury good, and if we become richer, we'll just uh, you know, be able to spend enough money to actually solve it. Uh, and of course, there was also the Kuznets curve from the 1950s, where there was a similar argument about, um, you know, growing the economy first and then splitting the pie equitably. Uh, and I think uh, for all of these, there's loads of debate and, and there's more or less evidence. But it basically, uh, the bottom line is that you can never take GDP as a proxy for well-being, for sustainability, and inequalities. There is, of course, uh, debates, certain uh, debates to be had, uh, but you cannot just take this as a proxy for any of these phenomena. 
Now, this, I think, hopefully is, is quite well known, although the paradigm we've been working on lately, so hopefully that provides a little bit uh, more of a, um, a view of what we're working on. Um, when I started working on this topic, uh, CBS, uh, uh, in 2007, um, we started, as any good scientist does, uh, to review all the metrics. And this is only a subset of all the metrics that we have in our, uh, in our world. Um, NGOs, academics, even individuals that go into retirement. <laughs> Everybody wants to invent the, new, uh, the, the latest thing. Um, and uh, so um, I think what the point I would like to make about this is that for 50 years, we've been have the strategy of constantly developing new indexes. So every month I will find uh, a posting on X or LinkedIn or in my email about a new index with a new name and then a new institute promoting their, their work. And just from a, a community perspective, it's a very striking a strikingly different approach than GDP, where there was this harmonization. And I think the core thing that I'd like to say is that look at all the terminology that's involved in all of these metrics. Uh, whenever I speak to a journalist, the first quarter of an hour will always have to be uh, about, yeah, didn't Bhutan have a happiness index? Isn't there a human development index? Isn't there, aren't the SDGs, what do they measure? So basically, all of these things are confusing ourselves. It took me quite a while to actually understand all of these things. And it's confusing the media. And I think for the general public, it's just totally un not understandable. And so the core aspect, I think, is that there is no common language. We don't even have the same terms to actually have this debate. What are the dimensions of beyond GDP? For 50 years, we've been saying beyond GDP, but we don't actually have a term of what we do want to measure. And so this is really quite a foundational aspect of a lot of research is actually not to create any new index, but to actually see whether we can make some kind of synthesis of all of these metrics. See whether we can see commonalities rather than differences and then start promoting our own. And so, and see whether through that methodology we could actually also uh, influence uh, uh, global and European uh, policy. Now, I think my book actually started with a sentence, uh, this book is written out of despair because I had that word cloud in mind. And I was like, where the hell are we going? For 50 years, we have been doing this work and everybody keeps thinking of a new index. What, what is this contributing? And so, um, this book is written out of despair, but actually for over the last couple of years, there is a growing momentum also to actually start um, synthesizing and harmonizing. And I'd like to take you through a couple to show you that there is quite a bit of momentum. So in April, I was invited to the General Assembly to speak on, on this um, initiative by the Secretary General. It's called Valuing What Counts. And basically what they want to do is to have a harmonization process where there will be 10 to 20 beyond GDP indicators um, adopted uh, worldwide. So this will be kind of a recommendation for countries to start measuring uh, 10 to 20 indicators. And if everything goes well, it will be, there will be a group of experts um, developing a recommendation in March. And then in September at the Summit for the Future, um, it will, uh, you know, these 10 to 20 indicators will actually be uh, proposed. And I think that will have an effect of um, of being far more focused. I th people might know these sustainable development goals, which is a list actually of nearly 200 indicators, but this will have uh, far more of a, a focus. And what I find really, uh, what I'm really happy about is that um, there is a, a conceptual frame, framing of the uh, outcomes of sustainable development in terms of well-being and agency, respect for life and the planet, and reduced inequalities and greater solidarity. So there's three dimensions of sustainable development. First, there's the average well-being now. Then there's the future well-being, which is more or less sustainability. And there is the inequalities, uh, disparities part. 
And I think that also provides a great opportunity to start really drilling down on the nouns and the adjectives that we need in these narratives and conversations. So the nouns are basically well-being, sustainability, and inclusion. Uh, and you can also then use the adjectives sustainable and inclusive. And then rather than saying beyond GDP, we can also say, well, it's striving towards inclusive and sustainable well-being. So it, it does link to the words, I think. The conceptual framework links to the words that we will need uh, in, in, um, you know, in creating this language and these narratives. Second aspect, I think, which is really interesting is that the actual handbook for GDP, um, uh, so where we actually are told how to measure GDP, the second chapter will be on well-being and sustainability. So economic statisticians are realizing that, you know, just having a GDP figure pushed into the world uh, leads to a lot of criticism. And so they have, ha actually have separate working groups thinking about, well, what is the relationship between GDP, uh, the system of national counts, and the measurement of well-being and sustainability? And there will be separate chapters going into greater methodological detail on well-being and sustainability. Oh, I still had this. Uh, uh, if, if this speech had been two weeks earlier, you could actually have had a bit of influence on this topic because there was a, a draft. Um, you, you can actually find the draft on the website if you're interested. So two quite important uh, UN processes, um, and also in the European Commission space, um, this is the Beyond Growth uh, conference, which was held before the summer. Did anybody go there by any chance? It might not. Okay, right. So uh, 35 of our students of, in, at Leiden actually hired a bus to, to go there. Um, it was quite uh, a setting. It was in the European Parliament. Ursula von der Leyen was also in the opening panel. And it was really to discuss, you know, what might a society look like uh, beyond, uh, beyond growth. And to kind of back up all of that work, the European Commission has also funded loads of Horizon projects. Um, so I won't go, be going through them, but we are just one. Wise Horizons is just one of uh, five research programs. And then there's Merge, of which we're also a part, which is kind of a, a CSA call where we collaborate uh, between uh, the, the uh, what is it, the five uh, projects. So that's one thing really to organize workshops and, and conferences and those kind of things. And then there's the, uh, there is uh, 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 an ERC grant was assigned to Steinberg, Kallis and Hickel. Uh, called the real project so quite a bit of research funding is going into this uh, topic in the next four to six years and i think now is the moment also to, to have a little bit of show you a little bit what wise horizons will be doing in this space so of course um you always start with a theoretical framework and the wise does stand for well-being inclusion and sustainability so we have embedded in the these um, these terms, and um, uh, there's a theory of change in our theoretical framework, which is very similar to what I showed in in the circular uh, in the circular uh, figure, and we're looking at it from three technical perspectives: metrics, accounts, and models. So we're basically trying to mimic the success story of the system of national accounts, macroeconomics, and see what would happen if we tried to uh, reproduce that that mechanism. Then we'll have one report we'll call the global report, which is actually a, a historical analysis. So we're going to try and see if we look at developments from 1820 to now from the lens of well-being, inclusion and sustainability, does that actually change our perception of the empirical uh, or the developments that we, uh, we have seen? And that will also use <laughs> a, a wise database, where, uh, which we already have actually where we have loads of indexes and indicators on, on this topic. And then we, uh, the, the problem with this field is that macroeconomists also have you know, ways of projecting their um, future GDP. And there are, of course, also population models and there are climate models, but really models that um, project well being or project inequalities are quite rare. Um, and also sustainability is usually just restricted uh, to climate change, not a broader set of uh, future welfare uh, aspects. 
And so what we've done is, you know, it's just too large of a job, of course, that that'll take uh, many decades uh, or hopefully less to actually create models that look at these topics in an integrated fashion. But we do want to um, gain a lot of experience by looking at various nine thematic models where we look at some of these relationships um, in a partial way. And then towards the end, we do want to at least make an attempt to see uh, whether we could actually uh, have more of an integrated view of, of uh, well-being, inclusion, and sustainability. But that is very much towards the end of the project. And then we also have our website, which we're really using to uh, output all of this information. One final aspect is that we do actually um, develop all these things in a very co-creative way. Uh, we've just had our first lab, which we call the Future Lab, uh, our Just Transitions Lab move is upcoming in a month. Uh, and basically what we're doing there is to, to get input on the models and the theoretical framework uh, to make sure that uh, we have input from stakeholders. And I'll show you in a moment also uh, how you might be able to uh, join those kind of labs. So let me just, uh, we already have some results. We've been working since uh, January on these topics. So let me first show you the synthesis of, of metrics. So I showed you a work cloud with loads of different metrics. Um, but if you actually look at these and you give them all an acronym, uh, it's not very important to actually know all of the, the acronyms, but it's important to realize that the work cloud can be structured. So up here, you have indexes that are basically measuring uh, current average well-being. Here are indexes for inclusion uh, and dashboards sometimes. And there are uh, indexes or dashboards for uh, future well-being. And sometimes an, uh, a measurement system will measure two of those dimensions and sometimes uh, th all three of them. Now to illustrate a little bit, you know, what kind of things you might find there, it's very interdisciplinary. If you think about well-being, it's not very obvious that only a macro or only economists think about well-being. There are many different scientific schools of thought that actually think about this topic. And so you have the Human Development Index, which was created by uh, Amartya Sen, uh, based on the capability approach. It's a, it's a little bit of a dumbed down version of, the, of his uh, quite extensive work, but uh, that is an approach. There's more the welfare economics part where economists will actually monetize certain dimensions of welfare, just, such as leisure time or uh, other positive and negative aspects. Um, one example is the benefits and costs experienced, um, and that had been around actually since the 1970s, this approach. Then there's subjective well-being, where you basically ask people uh, about their life satisfaction. And there's also the U-Index, which I find a really fascinating one, uh, which was also developed by Nobel Prize winner uh, Daniel Kahneman. So basically, loads of big names have been involved in this domain, and quite often, you'll hear the criticism, uh, you know, that it cannot be measured, but, you know, uh, I, I would say that there are at least very, some very clever people have uh, dwelled on this topic and, and have created ways in which to uh, measure this current well-being. On the sustainability front, you also have two different streams. These are the two dominant streams, I think. So on the welfare economics part, you have something called comprehensive wealth, where we basically say, well, um, our world has um, a economic capital, financial capital, human capital, social capital, and natural capital. And if we leave enough capital to future generations, then basically they can uh, have more well-being uh, than we have. So it's a very economic production function approach, and it's adopted by the World Bank and also the United Nations Environmental Programme. And then there's more of a planetary boundaries perspective, which actually doesn't use any economic theory, but uh, basically says our natural systems have nine natural limits um, and we should not transgress these limits. So which is a very different way of viewing, of course, uh, the sustainability uh, issue. Now, as I said, we're trying to connect these indicators, these synthesis of indicators to accounts uh, and indexes. And to do that, it's really important to dwell on the accounts. Uh, and then I'll also link it to the models. 
So basically, in sustainability science, we know that there is these, you know, the economy is embedded in society, society is embedded in the environment. And what is interesting is that we've developed a really good uh, accounting system for the economy. And then what economists have done is, is incrementally said, well, if I added a little bit of society, I added a little bit of, of the planet, so to speak, then, you know, then I could expand the the limits of the economy, so to speak. But interestingly, Richard Stone, the developer of the um, of the system of national accounts, so he was actually the architect of the SNA, he in his Nobel Prize winner had a different definition of accounting. In the first paragraph, he says basically accounting is the analysis of stocks and flows um, in any uh, units that you would um, care to measure. So that might be in monetary units, but it could also be in people, in natural resources, in mass, uh, in energy. Even cars, of course, have a, an accounting framework in stocks and, and flows. So he defined actually accounting in a br much broader sense. And if you look then, so in our wise accounting, basically we're saying, well, for the economy, we have these stock flow accounts in the system of national accounts. But if you look at demographers, for example, what are they doing? They're measuring uh, the starting amount of people, then they're measuring the amount of people that die and get born and that migrate, and you get a new stock of people. In fact, a demographer is an accountant. What do climate scientists to do or natural cycle? Uh, uh, what, what's natural cycles? We have a certain amount of um, uh, carbon in the ground in terms of fossil fuels. That's dug up, it's burnt, it goes to the atmosphere, it leaves a stock there, but it also leaches into the oceans. That is a stock flow account. So a climate scientist is in fact a, a climate accountant. And so actually uh, accounting is an interdisciplinary subject that actually all um, disciplines can actually contribute to. And I don't think there's any economist that would argue that the natural scientists are the best climate accountants there are. And there's no climate accountants that would disagree with how produced capital is measurement, measured. So actually this is the area where there's very little uh, for uh, interdisciplinary disagreement. The, the interdisciplinary disagreement comes actually later in the cycle. From these accounts, of course, there are many um, factors that can influence uh, well-being or sustainability. Um, and these are also the indicators that then end up in the indexes that I just showed you from different scientific perspectives. And this is where, this is where always the fighting, the interdisciplinary fighting takes place because the economists believe that using welfare economics either for current welfare or using it to measure wealth, that that's just the best thing there is. Um, and, you know, people which come from a planetary boundary perspective will basically say, yeah, this is just ridiculous. Uh, you know, there's limits to the planet and these models do not take that into account. So actually, the level of disagreements, I would argue, is, is also a recipe for interdisciplinary research, because here there is no disagreement, and there you can have, you know, there are different schools of thought on how to measure uh, these topics. And then the final level of the technical aspects is the, the modeling, uh, and so we want to base that on these uh, wise accounts uh, systems. And so, for example, in the degrowth literature, which is a stream of literature which says, well, how can we reduce the economic activity in a way which is good for well-being uh, and, and sustainability? So what is sometimes argued is that we should all reduce our work. Sometimes it's called a four-day work week. And basically what happens is, of course, that as we reduce our work, we might uh, we would reduce our work hours and maybe increase our leisure time. Uh, it might uh, influence consumption if that also leads to reduction in income. Uh, and that then has an impact, uh, both sometimes positive, sometimes negative, on these indexes. And simultaneously, of course, because you are reducing your consumption, 
then that leads to uh, lower or it could lead to lower CO2 emissions. There are, of course, it does depend what you actually do with your leisure time, of course. If you <laughs> travel to, to Thailand twice a year with that additional time, then it's, it's not a given that this actually leads to reductions. But the mechanism through which you would research that would actually be through the consumption column and then its influence on uh, CO2 emissions. And so we're trying to make a layered synthesis of how to measure uh, well-being, sustainability, and inclusion, how to actually structure that in an account interdisciplinary accounting system, and how to use that then in modeling uh, of the future. Some uh, output that you could also, I think this is my second to last slide, so uh, I'm looking forward also to the discussion. Some things that you can already access. Uh, in our consortium, we have uh, the, this is not actually a project outcome, but also the group uh, of Thomas Piketty and Lukas Kansel are involved here, uh, our consortium partners. So they've developed a really wonderful uh, inequality database that you can access. And at Leiden now, we've created this um, beyondgdp.world website where you can find, I think now, 20 different indexes. Uh, because all of this data was spread all across the world. Um, and we've basically collated it in, into one place. Uh, and so you, if you want to also do analysis of these various indexes and indicators, uh, you're free to, to use that as a resource. And as I said, we also have a project website and um, you can uh, join the network. Um, this is where you'll get newsletters, but also maybe invitations for this co-creation uh, panels. And um, so there are all, already some, um, some uh, resources that you can actually uh, go towards. So basically what we're trying to do is, is have an interdisciplinary perspective on this topic, uh, but which, which does try and harmonize the terminology. Um, and I do really believe that these UN processes will be uh, create a lot of impulse to actually start harmonizing what we've learned in the last 50 years. Uh, and last but not least, if you would like to sign up to the network, this is the address. And if you're interested more in the measurement aspect, I would advise going to beyondgdp.world. Uh, thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much for your nice overview. Are there questions? Like what you said, with the four day work week, it depends if the CO2, uh, the, how, how the leisure time is spent. But also the type of work people are doing also depends. I mean, there are films people can provide that don't really pollute at all. Yeah. So uh, but... in that sense, it's also very awkward that nowadays there is um, the, the, the whole elderly problem uh, is said, well, Actually, services for elderly people, like you know, attentive att 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 services, yeah. they are not polluting at all. I mean, it's not like, I mean, in a hospital, of course, a lot of waste is produced, but just the elderly services, not. Yeah. So, yeah. you could argue if it's bad for an economy to have a uh, much bigger percentage of the economy being uh, the, ser the debt services part. Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree, and, but, but that's also why you need to model these things. So just saying the four-day work week will be a solution, you know, it'd be good for well-being and good for, for the planet, it's not automatic. So that's also why I think you need models of these things. As you also said, like, it is a fairly, not very intuitive when you say to policymakers, you know, we've just had, we, we have the lowest unemployment there is, people are screaming to get people to work for them. Uh, and there's aging, uh, aging, of course, rapidly onsetting. And then to have a discussion about the four day work week does sound quite dis, uh, um, not very intuitive to a lot of policymakers. So even there, you would need to think about which services and uh, consumption and production that would be, and also how much uh, supply of labor will there be, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Um, I, from the way media write about uh, economic growth, you always get the impression as a reader that if growth stops, everything will break down and society will fall apart. Are there really, let's say, hard arguments to counter that to say that this is not the case and a society can actually work with 
decreasing growth. That I think that would be very important if you could put forward such arguments. Yeah, that's also uh, a lot of people in the degrowth movement, so which are actually you know saying we need to reduce economic growth. The, the pushback they often get is exactly this, and then people associate that with a recession. So you know that is an uncontrolled reduction in GDP, where there's um, unemployment and and those kind of things. So that's very often associated with very negative consequences. And the degrowth people then uh, argue, well, this is a controlled reduction. And one of the ways, for example, this four day work week, I think you know maybe some of you have done this so that you actually quite consciously. Uh, uh, um, you know, decide to work from five days to four days um, in certain periods of your life or whatever. Um, uh, and that is actually a degrowth strategy at an individual level where it's not disruptive. It's a choice that you have. Uh, and, and the way that they then frame it is that it's actually uh, uh, at, the, at the society level, it, that's the decision, you know, to take these kind of things like a four day work week at a society level and just uh, don't amp up the pressure of the economic growth. So, but I mean, I think in this debate, uh, it's sometimes not very, very much science space. It's just more rhetoric. Like you know, they want to crash the economy, or um, and uh, and sometimes also the opposite way around. It's as if economists do do nothing else than think about economic growth and how to maximize it. You know, economists have loads of research. That it, that it has a lot to do with uh, with well being dimension. So that's also why I'm very interested in this interdisciplinary conversation, where it's not demonizing kind of one uh, school of thought towards the other, which you see quite a lot, but rather thinking of what do e what does each discipline actually tell us about the you know how to move forward and doing what you like can also be beneficial. <laughs> Yeah so, so yeah. yeah, so one of the most famous economists, uh, Keynes of the last uh, century, he actually wrote in 1930, he wrote a, 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 a piece on what his uh, grandchildren would be doing in 2030. And his, his prediction would be that uh, I think we would work around 11 hours uh, a week. And uh, for the rest of the time, you'd be reading poetry and doing ballet and looking at uh, beautiful pictures because he was a real art lover. <laughs> and so... Yeah, his vision was productivity would go up so much, we would not need to work because things that we needed would just be produced. And so we'd actually use that um, that space to actually increase our leisure time and do things related to art. But for uh, an artist, of course, the, the, the leisure time is actually work time. Yes, so exactly. So, the yeah, for so the economy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but, but so I don't know whether the artist would work that much. I hope that a lot of professionals also like their work that much. That yeah. Like, not only for the money, but just that yeah. they like to work full time. Yeah, yeah, but what is the role of the system? We have capitalism here, and we have the big tech. What yeah. has happened with them? Yeah. So I think they're actually benefiting from this. Um, so, so GDP economic paradigm is benefiting, I think, a lot of the power movers. And so simultaneously uh, to organizing our own community, we also need to think of how to um, fight these power structures. But I'm very much a believer that to fight power, uh, you also need to generate power. And when I look at that word cloud, I do not see power. If you have that many different measurement systems, such such confusion, uh, that is not a basis for this power. Because I think there are many companies uh, governments that are interested in this topic, but are, the confusion that we are creating is actually making us less powerful to actually also create an alternative. So I believe, I, I do also believe in fighting the power structures. And I think, you know, things like um, um, fossil fuel subsidies, uh, demonstrations, those are actually also part of this cycle of that I showed in terms of institutions. The institutions weren't listening about the fossil fuel subsidies. And so there were these protests, and now it's leveling up to the power structures, and those are, are changing. So we need to fight the power structures, but I think we also need to realize that we are making ourselves less powerful by having this word cloud and, and all of this confusion. Uh, I don't think you'll ever be able to have a, a front, so to speak. So it, it's not and or, but I also like to look at our own community and, and, 
you know, come on, this is not working. <laughs> okay. Can I speak in Dutch, please? Yeah. Okay. In Dutch. Yeah, maybe I'll translate or something. Okay. Maybe you can take my question with this. I'm so happy with your story. Oh, I, I, I was going to English. I think this This is my my face dog on the on the zoo for commons ten years. And I have heard from the festival now, but look now the mondial transformation of the system, from unipolar power to multipolar power, and to regional networks. What now Israel and Palestine all look is. Ik onderzocht wat is postkapitalistisch systeem yeah. als mondiaal zo gaande is. Hoe gaan wij het systeem in de hand nemen tot deze keer niet meer door hoe wordt overgenomen door een, een procent van twee die wereld in de hand heeft. Natuurlijke hulpbronnen, mensen en kapitaal, yeah. dus arbeid, mensen is arbeid en kapitaal, allemaal in hun regie. Hoe kunnen wij deze keer regie in de hand nemen? Dus vooruit kom ons. Yeah. En ik heb in groepen van zeven, groepen van vijfhonderd, allemaal onderzocht, taal was het probleem. En ik, oh. ik heb één groot probleem, ja dat is feest, wat jij zei, omdat ik heb het nergens gehoord. En de volgende is dat wij allemaal aan de rand zijn van, uh, uh, van uh, kudde. Door individualisering. Dus wij zijn geen individu's, we zijn diepers. We zijn niet, we zijn deelbaar. Ze hebben van ons eenzame individus gemaakt, die gestuurd wordt door zo'n uh, gigantische strijd tussen de taal als basis van commons. Ja. Vele commons zijn doorgebroken. Wat gebeurt? Jij hebt media, bijvoorbeeld in Palestina, Israël. Ik, ik luister iedere avond tot drie uur s ochtends nieuws van de hele wereld. En ik zie hoe tussen drie dagen met nepnieuws wordt in het Westen mentale processen ontwikkeld waar wij met zijn alle verlamd raken en Hamas zien als uh, verkrachter dit, dit, dit en we gaan akkoord met genocide van uh, Palestina. Hoe wil je dit voorkomen? Narratieven. Die narratieven zijn in de hand van media en echt die vrijheid dat vind ik nou even, sorry. Dat is het enige wat mijn hart drukt. Help mij. En ook ons. Yeah. Help even tot iedereen begrijpt wat ik zeg. So, uh, to, to summarize the question a little bit, uh, it was uh, complimentary, and, but also very much about the power structures, and especially power structures when they relate to global narratives, as we're seeing in the Israel Palestine conflict, where there's loads of disinformation. Um, So this model is not going to solve Israel Palestine. <laughs> Let me start there, right? <laughs> um, but I think you do raise a lot of points about this, you know, misinformation and narratives. And um, so I, I actually have a beyond GDP or beyond growth class. And one of the frameworks that I really love is of Jonathan Haidt. I don't know if anybody knows him. Yeah. Uh, Uh, he has he has a structure of moral um, uh, moral uh, sentiments, and you can actually uh, fill out your own or find out your own morality um, in uh, on a website called yourmorals.org. And um, progressive patterns are very different to conservatives, um, and and it helps you to understand your own morality and the way you look at the world. But it also helps you understand better how other people actually learn or look at the world and. You can imagine that my group of students is a very progressive bunch, right? Yeah, exactly. They want to change the world and, and stuff like that. But um, I, I actually let them fill out their morality so we can actually see, well, this is a fairly progressive bunch. And you are looking at the world, you are being triggered by certain things that you, you find important, but perhaps then missing the discussion that you sometimes have. Uh, for example, I made this argument about there's Nobel, many Nobel Prize winners um, that created these indexes if you're a progressive mindset you found that a really irritating thing to hear <laughs> because progressives uh, focus on the morals of uh, of care and fairness 
And conservative thinkers have three other dimensions. They also have a bit of care and fairness, but they also have dimensions of hierarchy, loyalty, and sanctity, so that things are holy. Uh, and so if you're conservative and you hear this argument, yeah, these Nobel Prize winners have thought of these indexes. I, I could see some people in the audience of my students, they were nodding, and others, they were like, what? <laughs> that doesn't convince me at all. <laughs> so actually the narrative, it's very much actually, if you're receptive to the narrative, is a reflection actually of yourselves, of your own circumstances. And I'm trying to help the students realize that they are viewing the word world in their own way. And the title of the book by Jonathan Haidt is called The Righteous Mind, uh, to illustrate that we actually always think that the, our way of viewing the world, that is more moral. Our morals are what everybody should believe. And he... I think is the best thinker around, or at least I haven't uncovered any others. And that helps you also with the narrative, because I'm actually going to ask my students to think of a beyond growth policy and then sell it to a progressive audience and a conservative audience. And for a progressive audience, you need to think of care and fairness, uh, discuss, it's not fair to, to pollute the planet for our uh, grandchildren. Well, if you're pitching it to a conservative audience, there would be more arguments like purity, nature is pure, or if you think it's a sanctity, say it's God's creation, or it's, it's, it's a holy, it's such a wonderful system, if you want to look at it more in a secular way. So actually messaging what you have, it's really important to understand the morality of, of the people you're messaging, and you can misuse that, so... Or you can actually also use it to your benefit in, in some cases. But of course, misuse is also what, what is happening in terms of misinformation. It's very often just a confirmation of the ideas that you already have about the world. So that would be my two cents. But I'm not going to solve any of <laughs> that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so what do you mean by uh, the term of inclusion? Because usually it's connected to financial inclusion. But yeah. In your model. So, yeah, so this is very much just the, uh, the disparities in well being. So, it has two levels. First, there's national discussions about disparities, right? So, there's gender differences, age differences, educational uh, or differences in well being and uh, education level, income levels. Even people with lower income actually live. Uh, live less long, uh, so they're uh, more unhealthy, for example. So all the disparities that we have in a society um, and also in a global North, global South. So it's not just in this literature, what's also um, done a lot is to look at disparities globally. Um, so there's inclusion global and inclusion national. Uh, but then you, of course, also come to the point, well, what level of equality uh, is is uh, are you striving towards and that's actually where i think that is also a, a political debate for example between progressives and conservatives uh, there are many ways to structure a society and it is part of the the political discourse to try and understand how uh, how far you want to go there uh, so that's actually part of that discussion Interestingly, for example, the system of national accounts, I said there is a narrative, but that is not actually true. The system of national accounts is the way we measure um, the economy. But after the war, there was more Keynesian, uh, more government-led economic policy, where it was called a mixed economy, where the economy and business basically worked together. And then there was a neoliberal phase where basically free markets and small governments was advocated. But they actually use the same numbers and the same terminology. So you can have narrative fights and debates about uh, what your vision is of inclusion. Uh, should it be that the powerful actually help the uh, help the people, or should also the people be helped to actually fight upwards? Uh, there are many ways in which you could frame that argument. And e even in economics, there is not one narrative. There are different visions of how to achieve economic growth. The only thing is that they, they agree, you know, the goal ultimately of macroeconomic policy is this, uh, this GDP increase. Right. I think I'll just be nice to ask a question myself also, because I was really interested when you presented the work packages of your project. 
Um, so you said you want to use partial models and then integrate these things. So could you explain a little bit more, especially since this is a complex system center, I mean, like methods occasionally. So how are you going to achieve that? Of course, it's the beginning of the project, so you may not know everything, but so how how would these thematic models look like and how will you integrate that? So I showed you the wise accounting framework, and currently there are basically the data um, databases that describe the global economic structure. So the IMF will be coming up with a database of all the stocks and flows, economic stocks and flows of all countries uh, in the world. Um, so basically, the economic accounting is settled, and we'd like to link it to this demographic accounting, so time use and um, people, and to the natural cycles um, uh, perspectives. Um, and so that is my initial foundation. And as we are building these models, um, I do. I am interested also in power dynamics and those kind of things. But I think for, uh, from a complex systems perspective, you might be a little disappointed by the initial models uh, because they are basically global economic networks linked to social uh, networks, I would say, and also hopefully uh, ecological networks. That would be the, the dream. But I think data-wise, um, it's a very macro view uh, initially with just stocks and flows at the three um, uh, at the three levels. That's already uh, quite a um, a lot, um, but uh, I could imagine. I, I would find it hard. I, do you do research on the uh, things called multi-regional input-output tables? These are these global databases for economic structures, and I do know that because that those have all the global value chains they're called. So all the production structures in the world are linked, and you can analyze those. Uh, I think using complex system modeling, but uh, that would be perhaps an area of overlap, but um, yeah, I don't know whether this is disappointing, but I'm not expecting that the models that we create would really wow you at any moment, but uh, maybe I have a certain vision of what complex systems does, but... Uh... That's it. So you had a question too? Yeah, uh, I really like your research, but I was wondering one thing about uh, Work and care, and I, I, maybe you can show the indicators again. You had a bit of towards the end. Uh, where, where, oh, the towards the end, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I feel that okay. In, in in certain societies like here, uh, we 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 made work from a lot of a lot of things that used to be uh, care yeah. and services, like uh, cleaning the house. Or, uh, and going out for dinner, these kind of things that maybe in the past or in other societies are considered um, care or services. Uh, but here it's work. You now we hire a cleaner or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, so it feels more like this is some kind of access instead of two different things that you can measure. So how do you how do you take uh, those kind of things into account where it actually it might be one thing you're considering instead of two different indicators? Yeah. So so there actually for. Quite a few decades there has been suggestions of like for example uh, care work or household work or uh, cooking and cleaning that we should actually add that to the uh, economy because it's a, a production it's actually being produced and as you said if you actually do uh, cooking yourself in one year and the uh, year after you decide to go uh, out to eat every day then actually you're shifting from a non-economic economic process towards uh, an economic process so basically, there have been debates about uh, shifting that um, uh, for a very long time. And I think there's even 40 plus countries that, for example, add household work to as a satellite account to their GDP figures. Uh, so this is a, a really well known debate. Um, and basically, what, what is happening is that you are shifting in your time use, right? So you're hiring a person to clean your house or to do the uh, to go to restaurants. It's actually saving you uh, some time uh, usually, and maybe also adding to the experience in the case of going out. Um, so it's very much uh, in the domain of leisure time uh, and uh, hours worked. Uh, and so we will be creating a time use in actual. Um, um, hours, uh, time use accounting, 
Uh, but then how you value that time uh, is sometimes quite difficult. So in these the projects that have looked at this production, um, you know, how do you value uh, a cleaning time? You know, do you then give, give yourself the same salary basically as the cleaner that you're hiring? You know, there's quite a few methodological aspects to that. And I find it more interesting to look at the U index, which was created by Kahneman, because he actually links um, uh, time used to affect measurements. And so there are many activities in your life that you find really enjoyable, and there are certain ones that you find less enjoyable. So uh, he actually links all these activities. And of course, if you don't enjoy cooking or cleaning or those kinds of things, you would actually want to substitute away from those activities. Um, and it also has a historical context. I don't know whether you know the book uh, by Robert Gordon, uh, who actually looked at um, um, productivity growth in the last two centuries in the US. And his argument was also very much that, uh, technologically speaking, in the 1920s and 30s, houses in the US um, started to become connected to electricity, water, um, uh, communication uh, type um, um, infrastructure. And that saved a lot of time because then also technologically speaking, uh, washing machines, um, um, uh, doing the dishes, washing, those kind of things. And then when the Second World War struck, suddenly uh, a lot of men actually were sent off, of course, to war. But a lot of women actually had the time at that stage to actually start uh, in the war economy. And that had a, a perpetual effect on the fact that after <laughs> the men came back, uh, the women stayed in the workforce. So there, there's an interaction between time use, technology, uh, uh, geopolitical forces, and actually developments uh, that led to a change in emancipation. Uh, that, that's his argument in terms of emancipation of, uh, of women. So it, it's a very complex question. And sometimes it dumb, it's dumbed down to, you know, let's just measure what this production is worth. But I think there's a larger story sometimes with these numbers to be told. Um, so it's it's um, one o'clock, so I don't say everybody has to go, but I think maybe we should give a round of applause and everyone who wants to stick a bit longer can, can do this and everybody who has the next meeting can uh, do that. So thank you very much. <laughs>